Today I think I have a special treat for you. Um, back in October, I was in Israel and I had the privilege and uh, honor to be in the house of Harari. Micha and Shoshana Harari uh, are well known throughout the world for the harps that Micha makes and, um, and then Shoshana is playing on the harp. and. Uh, so we got to visit their, their uh, workshop and studio and while we were there uh, Shoshana consented to give me an interview and so I wanted to share uh, parts of the interview with you. Uh, I believe Shoshana has a very good handle on what I believe harp playing is all about and uh, she gives a little history of the harp, she gives some, uh, some ideas and, uh, but most of all she talks about finding your song and doing it in a way that is you and not having to, to conform to all of the other ways that people think it should be done. And that's kind of the idea I've been trying to get across to all of you is that um, it's more important, I believe, that you have more fun, fun playing the harp rather than being perfectly technical playing the harp. And so um, I will now put on the interview with Shoshana I hope you enjoy it and um, maybe get glean some uh, glean some some little nuggets out of it that uh, can help you move forward with finding your song in the harp and playing it and uh, enjoying it and at some point letting others enjoy it as well. So, without saying anything more, let's go forward into the interview. Uh, enjoy. Scorpions, but nevertheless, it's <laughs> kind of there. So somebody, my theory is they were redecorating. <laughs> but anyway, somebody drew a picture on the cave wall of a harp that looks kind of like this. And it's the first picture, it, the archaeologists by carbon dating say it's 3,000 years old, oh, wow. which is around the time of King David. Mm -hmm. And um, they, it's primitive, but it's the first one of this kind. Before that are the others, which you know you can see on the other kinds of harps. They were earlier. They go back all the way to the uh, um, great grandson of King of no no the great grandson of Adam and Eve, <coughs> whose name was Yuval. Or Yuval, Jubal. yeah, right. right. You might have heard of him. Yeah. And um, so we he decided that that's the harp he was going to make. And, you know, he thought he'd just join with other harp makers and things like that. But it turned out that we were the only ones, and we were the ones who were bringing back the harp of David, literally, from off the willow trees. So that happened because a woman, as in the process of building it, we were also living as far away as we could get. Like in a small country like this, it's pretty hard to get far away. We couldn't do the distance that we had before. But nevertheless, we, we did our best <laughs> to be far away. And there was a woman who um, came to our house to pick lemons from the tree. You know, it goes on my story. It can go on for years. <laughs> anyway, she was, it turned out, oh, Lord, what does that mean, singing a new song? It means that you already have a song. You just have to rediscover it. And so the biblical harp is different than most harps because it really requires literally zero technique in order to play it beautifully. You don't have to hold your elbows in the air or your thumb in any particular position. You could literally hold the harp completely upside down and you could play it. And it would still sound beautiful. <laughs> so the point is that when he says that, he's saying, go for the tree of life. You can leave the tree of knowledge finally the tree of knowledge with the internet and everything has blossomed, bloomed, fruited, and is coming to the end. And now the only tree left is the tree of life. And mm -hmm. that's where this harp is coming from mm -hmm. because it helps you to go back into your own soul and to renew your connection with the God who created everything. And so it's kind of like you could say you have like a cage inside you with a, a beautiful bird that's been locked away with a rusty lock. 
And so the harp is a combination of WD-40 and a good screwdriver. <laughs> yes, and it unlocks that cage and lets the bird out so that it can finally sing. So I think of all the things that the harp can do, and I'm going to show you many of them, the most important thing that I feel is for you to find your new song, which is actually an old song for yourself, but it's new to the whole world because no one's ever heard it. And it connects you with yourself. It's a vibration. And the world, the universe, God, all the angels, they know you through your vibration. You might have a name, it could be an unusual name, but I guarantee you that somewhere in this world of 8 billion people, there's somebody with that name. There, oh, yeah. there is. Mm -hmm. They may pronounce it differently, but it's still the same name, but nobody has your song. Nobody. What if our new name is the song? What if your new name is the song? Could be. But it also has to come with music. Does right. it come with music? Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Okay, so um, so there's a few things about this harp that are very unique to this harp as opposed to any harp in the world. Um, first of all, it has 22 strings. The 22 strings relate to the 22 letters of the Hebrew Aleph Bet, which you may know is the alphabet, but that's actually Greek. But Aleph Bet is the word Aleph and Bet, <laughs> which are two letters of the Aleph Bet. <laughs> so, these, this, what does this do? First of all, in the Gemara, it says that, the, which is the writings that came after the Bible, um, it says that there was never a harp that had more than 22 strings. They had less. They could have 12, they could have 10, they could have whatever, but they never had a 23 string harp or more than that, which is really the harps of today. The harps of today are bigger, they have more strings, they, you know, they can be played in restaurants <laughs> and things like this, but this, is an instrument of prayer. This is an instrument of spiritual warfare. This is an instrument of prophecy and of healing. And these things don't require any more strings than that, which is kind of interesting. Anyway, so I'm going to show you first about the letters, because that's kind of an interesting thing. All right, so um, ha who here knows any Hebrew? You do. You know the alphabet. Do you know any words, though? It's a good thing to know. Yeah. Um, all right. So maybe you know this word. <clears throat> um, it's an important word to know. Okay. So I'm going to tell you the letters for those of you who do know a little Hebrew. And if you do know the word, you can say it. <laughs> and then everybody has to buy you lunch. <laughs> so this is a contest, but only for the people who actually could tell. <laughs> all right. So Aleph, hey. Bet, hey. Abba. What? It's no. Ahava. <laughs> what? Ahava. Yes. Yes, right. Okay. Ahava. Ahava. What does Ahava mean? Love. 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 Uh -huh. Right. So love is um, a theory. It's a feeling. <clears throat> it's an idea. It's a lot of things, but it's also a sound. mean? That means that you're expanding the music. It's still music. And if I didn't tell you that that was Ahava, you just think it's pretty or nice or whatever you think. But once you understand that this sound that I just did is connected with the idea, the feeling, the theory, or whatever it is of love, then you understand that this can go further than just music. So what I did is I used it as a rhythm because it's only a few notes and I just created something as a melody and it sounds like this. just, just the beginning. You literally could take the Bible in Hebrew and you could play the entire thing as a musical composition. And that is awesome. 22 letters. 22 letters. Because what is the story with the 22 letters? They are the literal DNA of this world that we live in. God spoke this world into existence through these 22 letters and then in some mystical way they formed your eyes, this table, the stars in the sky, the birds and the trees, 
everything formed, and they are combinations of these letters. So whenever you're in any combination of these letters, you're literally connecting with the whole foundation of the world that you live in, and that's very powerful. Not to mention that each letter has its colors, it has its other connections, all kinds of things. Were you going to say something? No, no you there was a bug. Uh, <laughs> a fly. <mosquito> or yeah. <laughs> it was trying to leave because it actually hates these things. <laughs> all evil hates the sound of the harp. And that's another aspect, which is the aspect of David and Saul, yeah. the most famous uh, example of music therapy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> where Saul was a very troubled being because he did something. Some things can be corrected. You know, you could steal money from someone and you could give it back and even give restitution. But if you do certain things like murder someone or do something that cannot be changed, then there's nothing you can do. You have to live with what you did until the judgment of God either has mercy on you or however it works out. But he did something that couldn't be fixed. And so he lost his kingship even though he was still wearing a crown on his head. And he knew that someone else was actually anointed in his place. And when he would think of it, it would make him crazy, <laughs> literally crazy and very depressed. And so since no one knew about what was really going on here, um, he was alone. And besides that, he couldn't even confide in anyone because no one knew, not his family, not his servants. He was alone with this knowledge that he literally wasn't. He was a king in, with a shell. He was a shell of a king. So anyway, so they wanted to make him feel better. They didn't understand what was wrong with him. And so they, uh, the irony, of course, is they said, let's bring in somebody who can play the harp really good, who is connected with God in some way, and bring in the harp. And why was it the harp? They had flutes. They had drums. They're also very nice, and they can also make you feel better. Why they picked the harp? Who knows? Because they didn't know the things we know about the healing properties of the heart, but they did. And who did they pick <laughs> but his actual the next anointed king. king, the secretly anointed king, which is the irony all through the Bible like that. So David came and he played with his hands, as it says, and it says two things. Saul began to feel better, and the evil spirit departed from Saul. The evil spirit departed from Saul just from this? Like, how could that make anything run away? But it does. Because to them, it would be the equivalent in human terms of fingernails on a blackboard. Yeah. They hate it, and they run like crazy. On the other hand, it very much attracts angels. I mean, I don't see them myself, but people have told me that they, when I start playing the harp, they see angels all over this room. So if you are able to see that, keep, look, keep your eyes open. But... For sure, there's no evil in this place. I can tell you right now. <laughs> okay, so that's part of the healing aspect. Now, 3,000 years later, they know that it, um, they have tools to measure things, and they know that it affects us, uh, our nervous system, mm -hmm. people who have nervous uh, problems like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. things like that, that the heart really, really does amazing things for people. Uh, as long as they keep doing it, like they have to do it every day. It's not like one time shot. Um, they know that it works against cancer in some mysterious way. In Israel, there's a hospital doing research and they found that it increases oxygen absorption. Mm -hmm. What does that have to do with anything? The fact is in a declining oxygen world where we happen to be oxygen breathing creatures <laughs> and we actually need oxygen, um, Cancer grows very fast in a lack of oxygen. In a non-oxygenated body, cancer will grow. In a fully oxygenated body, cancer can't live. So it really does have a lot to do with it. On the other hand, it has a certain vibration that is completely connected to a healthy person. It has a vibration that actually um, is in tune with that. And um, if you're not healthy, then it will help you to tune yourself because every cell in your body is in a different mm -hmm. tuning. It need, has a different vibration it needs, but it gets it from the heart. Like a tuning key or a tuning fork or something like that, it actually allows your body to raise itself. And when you raise your vibration, then you're not going to get sick. Or if you already are, then you'll get well. 
Anyway, that's what it does. The person who gets the harp, who's playing the harp, which at the moment is me, <laughs> um, I get most of that vibration. But you're getting something too, and you can even get it from CDs, but it's not the same as sitting it here and playing each of the notes and letting them float through you. And so before you leave, <laughs> I'm going to play a song for you. Okay. And um, this is not my song. Uh, later I'm going to show them all my own song. But this is just a beautiful song from Sh Rabbi Shlomo Kalva. played in heaven, we mm -hmm. kind of know that, and um, people who, uh, before you're born, you live in a place in the <coughs> Eden called the City of Souls, or the Field of Souls, and right next to that field is a place that's a, a big, big, big rose garden, beautiful, amazing rose garden, a rose garden in heaven, which makes the roses on earth smell like cardboard. <laughs> right next to the rose garden is the place where the angels play the harp. This is all written. I didn't make this up. And um, the, the angels are playing the harp there. So every single soul that's on the earth, every single person, no matter where they live or how they live or anything, has smelled a rose and heard a harp. Mm. And that's why when you hear this harp, mm. you actually, something inside you awakens to the time before you were born. And it um, connect, reconnects you all the time. The same thing with smelling roses. So smell a lot of roses and listen to a lot of harps. <laughs> okay, this is the basic sound of the harp that anyone can do, and I will pass this around so you can all try it. change the scales so you can go into different scales uh, depending on you know how you're led to do it because if you're going to play your own song the harp doesn't know what songs you're going to play it, it just has to be ready for you so for example like this is a C scale everybody knows that you know <laughs> then you can change another note you can go into a Renaissance scale change it again and go into a scale from India. You can put them all down and go to a scale from Israel. You can go into another Israeli scale. Last 
before you, I can see you're ready to jump right out and see. I know, I know. I know. But it's okay. I'm trying to push it all in here, if you notice. Uh, this is a scale from China. Hmm. So the whole idea is that these are the same basic strings, but you're changing them in a million, million ways so that you can find your own scale, your own song, your own self. And when you find your own self, you will find worlds that will open to you. And it used to be in the old, old days, and this is written, that people knew how to bring back the dead, or people who died for, they weren't supposed to, they died too early, they weren't supposed to, it was an accident, something like that. They knew how to bring back these people by singing their song. Now, we don't even know our own song, let alone another person's yeah. song. So the first place we have to start is with ourselves. And when we start with ourselves and we can literally begin to know ourselves again, then number one, you will find your true purpose on earth. You will know why you're here. And number two, maybe you can help other people. Who knows? But you have to start somewhere, and that's the place. So you're halfway out the door. <laughs> Thank you. Why they, were prophesied. they didn't prophesy without the heart, believe it or not. And um, Isaiah, for example, literally it's written that he walked through the same city that you've been through, Jerusalem, and he prophesied with his heart. He walked through, played his heart, said things. Um, the school, there was a school of prophets where they had people who either played it or the prophets themselves learned to play it. Habakkuk, Elisha, these are specific ones that are mentioned. But actually, everyone who was a prophet had some connection with the heart. It just, that's the way it happened. Um, in the temple, um, there were 4,000 Levites who learned from the age of three how to play the harps. And they say there were, it says the sons and the daughters, so there were women there too, or girls anyway. And um, on the, twice a day, it was played, it had to be played. And then on Shabbat, there was a bigger, bigger group. And then finally, there was the three major festivals, one of which we just passed to quote, where everyone was required to come to Jerusalem. And there were so many harps played that the sound of the harp was literally heard in Jericho, which is very far away. And they didn't have a microphone or an amplifier or anything like that. They just had thousands of harps. 26 kilometers or 15 miles. Right. It's far away. <laughs> and uh, the incense and the sound of the harp traveled in that direction and they ended up that anybody sitting in a garden in Jericho actually heard it. They, some people say that they heard it in other nations, I don't know, but we know that's documented that they actually heard it in Jericho. So, you know, this is, it was such an integral part of what was going on here that when it, when it was hung on the willow trees when we went into exile, everything stopped. It's like musical chairs. Remember that game, musical mm -hmm. chairs? The music stopped, you gotta sit down. That's it, and for 2,000 years we sat down. Didn't hear anything like that, and then it just has returned. So there's that also the, the, um, the connection with prayer, and how it's an instrument of prayer, and it helps you to 
pray. Like, you can pray in your heart. You don't have to even open your mouth. You don't have to do anything. God can hear you. He hears what's going on in your mind. So be careful what you think. <laughs> but anyway, um, but there is this thing. And why did David pick up the harp? He didn't need to pick up the harp. Why did he do it? Because he knew that this is the express train. <laughs> it goes right to the throne of God with no passing anything, no getting collecting $200, no stopping getting tickets, nothing. Straight up. And he knew that he had to be heard for what was in his heart. He had to. It was a, a, an obsession. <laughs> so he picked up, he learned the harp because the harp was the one that's going to get there the best, the fastest, and p get the attention of everyone because it's an instrument. Literally, you're doing a duet. The angels are playing harps in heaven. You're playing harp on the earth. There's something between heaven and earth. There's some connection between heaven and earth that the harp does. And um, it's an eternal instrument. It's something that's going to go on to, into eternity. It's mentioned. Um, it's mentioned in the in the Jewish Bible. It's mentioned in the Christian Bible. It's mentioned in many many ways. So I, what I'm going to do first of all, does anybody have any questions? Yes. And he wanted to buy one of these harps. He was a concert harpist. He learned from the age of 12. He was 32 at the time. So that's many years. And in Japan, they don't play games. Like you learn it or you're out the door mm. and that's it. So he knew everything that there was to know about playing the harp, the concert harp. Anyway, I'm thinking, why does he want this harp? I don't know why he wants this harp. Anyway, of course, his English wasn't very good. His Hebrew was non-existent. I don't know how he actually made it around this country, but anyway, he did. And he came in. At the time, we had a lot of harps that were for sale. Now we only have one or two every now and then. But um, he picked out the harps he wanted, and then we talked a little bit, not very well, but anyway. And then he was walking out the door, and he turns to me and he says, I want to come back for a lesson. And I was like, a lesson? Like, I'm thinking for three days, what am I going to teach him? He knows everything. <laughs> So anyway, he finally came in, and I sat down, and I said, okay, let's be honest. You've been learning the harp for all these years. You know every theory. You know all the notes. You know uh, how to, the technique. You know millions of songs, I'm sure. What can I teach you? And he, like, looked me in the eye, and he said, teach me to be free. Amen. Yeah, and that's the thing. So he learned it through... Um, uh, constant practice and mm -hmm. constant technique of holding everything in the right position. But what his little child's heart wanted to do when he first wanted mm -hmm. to learn the harp was to be free to play the music of his own soul. Mm -hmm. And that's what I had to do with him. I had to throw out all that learning mm -hmm. and start again as if he was four years old. Wow. So for somebody who knows nothing, you're way better off. <laughs> Because all you have to do is learn from the beginning as just an empty page. King David did not go to a conservatory to learn yeah. to play the heart. So the point is if you have the heart to do it, you have the desire and the motivation, then you'll learn very easily because really it's so simple. Like, for example, I take this finger with right here in the center, up at the top, down at the bottom, anywhere at all on the string, it's going to be the same. I can do it with my little finger. Turn my hand upside down. It's always the same. So you don't have to knock yourself out to play something beautiful. It's, as long as the harp is in tune, it's going to be beautiful, no matter what you do or how you do it, whether it's like this or it's like this. Anyway, it doesn't make any difference. And the harp literally will play in the wind. If you go outside, it's a windy day, the harp will play by itself. Steve did that the other day. We yeah. went to visit. Um, some friends of theirs, and it was we brought them the windy. Mountain, and it was windy, and he held it up, mm -hmm. and you just hear it. Yeah, that's right. So it does that. It's very, very powerful instrument in a lot of ways, even though it's it's deceptively simple. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass this around to you and let you try it. Well, and um, a lot of people like that woman, nobody knew about what we were doing. We we're just kind of working it out. One day, though, I guess the word got out, and somebody, um, this man came from Mea Sharim. Does anybody know where that is? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So it's a very, it's probably the most 
Jewish religious area in the entire world. <laughs> and they came all the way to our place early, early in the morning, and he said, I want to see the, is this the house of the 10 string Kinor? That's what he said. So it's like another one <laughs> for you, <laughs> you know. And um, I said, you know, anyway, he starts telling me about himself, and he was like a very old man, and he said he lived through all the, he lived through Israel becoming a nation again, and, and through the Jerusalem becoming united. And like, he went on and on, the ingathering, the exiles, he, he went on and on, he had a whole long story. And he said, but the one thing I've never seen is the ten string kinor. And Micha, yeah. hey, this is my husband, Micha. You want to say hi to everybody? Shalom. My life, and I really, I heard it was here because I know that it's a sign of the coming of the Messiah. And I said, oh, really? I didn't know that. <laughs> so anyway, he comes in, he counts the strings three times because he wanted to make sure they're ten, and it doesn't take that long to count up to ten. <laughs> but anyway, and then he starts, he was dancing around the room, and he, it was like, it was very beautiful. <laughs> anyway, so that was the end. He left, and then he went on and started telling his friends, and after a while we had like a whole entourage of people coming to see the harps, and um, each one of them gave a little part of what they knew. And one of the things was that um, the Harp of Ten Strings, it's written, actually, okay, let me see if I can remember this. The Harp of Ten Strings is reserved for the song that will rise on the day when the world that is to be will be reunited in one harmonious whole. Yeah. So anyway, what that means is that there's going to be another scale. Like we were talking about different forms of music all the way down. There's the pentatonic scales, there's the eight, the octave, which is what we're kind of caught up in right now. And then there's going to be a ten note scale. And the ten note scale, we don't have the ten note scale. And the reason we can't get it is because two of the notes, literally, you can't hear them. Like, even my dog can hear sounds that mm -hmm. I can't hear. But we, we, we think we can, we see things, we hear things. Actually, we hardly see and hear anything. Mm -hmm. And so basically yeah. what it's saying is that there will be a scale that's coming, and it's like a bride, and we can't get near her because two of the notes are not in this world. And we aren't able to find the scale yet because we're not in the time when it's going to be played. So what this really means is that there are three things that are going to physically change when, we, when this whole time comes when the world radically and drastically changes and the Shia comes and all that. And the one thing is your heart. So they say that your heart is actually the size of your fist, mm -hmm. which is kind of right because most people use their heart as a fist mm -hmm. and there's a lot of hate in the world and they're using this beautiful organ of love to be the exact opposite. But in the future, it's going to grow. Your heart is actually going to grow because you're going to be filled with love, love for everyone. When everyone loves everyone else, then you know we have reached that place. <laughs> but at the time, right now, it's a hard world and you have to kind of defend yourself. You can't be too innocent in this world or things could happen to you. So you have to kind of be aware, but yet you want to stay in a situation of love, but yet it's still a little stony there. <laughs> So in the future, the stony heart is going to break apart. The harp has a lot to do with that because it, it really vibrates with your own heart. Harp, heart, they sound mm -hmm. very similar. The second thing that's going to happen are your eyes. So right now, we're looking around and we see the birds and we see the flowers and we see the trees and we see each other. But like I said, there are some people who can see angels. And right now in this room, I guarantee that there are angels, but only if you have a revelation can you actually see them. And in the future, we're going to be able to see such things. We're going to see angels. We're going to see beyond the curtain of this world. This world is like a curtain, and beyond the curtain is the rest of the world <laughs> that we do not have a privilege to see unless he gives us that privilege to see. And the third thing are your ears. So right now, there is something called the Parak Shira. I don't know if you ever heard of that. But this is a whole thing of speaking about all the creatures and how they praise God. Because everything right now is praising God. 
It's not just the frogs and the birds that sing. Everything is singing. The stars in the sky are singing. Or maybe you could call them vibrations, but they are singing. In a certain way, they're singing. The grass, the trees, everything is singing. And we don't hear it. We just don't hear Maybe if the wind blows really strong or something, but literally we don't hear it. And in the future, our ears are going to be unplugged mm -hmm. and we will hear the music of the universe the way we're supposed to. But right now, we're just kind of, you know, blundering through mm -hmm. <laughs> the best we can. But this harp is saying, like a robin that comes in the spring, the first robin, like you know that spring is coming because you see the robin. The robin mm -hmm. arrives, you know spring is close. So it's the same thing. When you see these harps that they have returned and really remember them in your heart that it's not long. Just hang in there. Clean your heart. Do the best you can. Take care of your body. Take care of your soul. Be kind to each other. That's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And sing your song if you can find it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, okay. So this is this harp. I'm going to show you one more.